Okay, hello everybody. Um, glad to see you all here with me. Today I have a pleasure to present one interesting topic and that is audio data augmentation. I will talk about different uh, techniques, best practices, some use cases and benefits of applying audio data augmentation. Uh, we already heard a brief uh, bio from my side, so I'm a staff data scientist and specialization lead at a company, Grid Dynamics. And just a quick introduction of the company. So Grid Dynamics is a global digital engineering company. It is a leading provider of technology consulting, agile custom software development, and data analytics for Fortune 1000 companies. As you can see, Grid Dynamics has offices across 14 different countries. It has more than three thousand and five hundred employees. The office in Serbia was opened in 2018. Currently we have more than uh, I think 470 employees in Belgrade and speaking of data science expertise we have more than 120 data scientists. Some of our clients are Apple, Google, eBay, Levi's, Nike, American Eagle, Home Depot and many more. Okay, well, let's go back to our main topic, and that is audio data augmentation. So I, I will explain what is audio data augmentation, why is it important, and how it works. Generally speaking, let's start with data augmentation. And I believe most of you are already familiar with this term. So uh, data augmentation is a technique used to increase the number of samples that we used uh, in our training data set during uh, model training. And uh, let's uh, take one example. So let's assume that we have some problem space with, which is presented with these blue dots. And what we achieve by applying data augmentation, we are generating some new similar data samples that are uh, presented with these uh, green dots. So what we are trying to achieve, we are trying to cover the problem space as much as possible. In case of audio data augmentation, we have an audio file as an input to a transformer, and then transformer performs some kind of transformation, usually some digital signal processing, and what we get uh, at the output, we get some augmented data uh, version, so a new version of a file. Data augmentation is widely used in computer vision. And Luke already mentioned that the internet is full of cat images. So uh, what can we do uh, with images? We can apply different kinds of transformations like image rotation, image cropping, shifting, image to the right, left, up or down. And we can generate more image samples. OK. so. Uh, why should we care about audio data augmentation? Obviously, uh, by applying this uh, augmentation, we are creating more data samples, and this way we are addressing the problem of data scarcity. Now that we have more data in our training data set, we are obviously increasing models' robustness, we are improving models' accuracy, and another consequence is reducing overfitting. And finally, we are also saving resources to collect and label data. We should remember and keep in mind that uh, data augmentation should be applied only on training data sets, never on uh, test and validation data set. Otherwise, we will deal with um, a data leakage problem. And also, we should keep in mind uh, that Augmented data is not as good as additional original data. So whenever we have option to add and collect original data and to add it to, to the training set, we should do it. But uh, I guess you're aware that sometimes it is not possible. Uh, collecting original additional data might be costly, time consuming and so on. And sometimes we don't have any other option but to uh, s generate more synthetic data and apply audio data augmentation. Now I have uh, here listed several of use cases where we can apply audio data augmentation. So we can apply it whenever we work with audio files and with machine learning. So one use case is building an um, automatic speech recognition system or 
building automatic speaker recognition or identification system. In such cases, we are working with huge data sets of voice recordings, hundreds of hours of recorded speech, and in order to increase the data sets, we can, of course, use augment, uh, audio data augmentation. Then we have another type of sound, which is music, and I believe you are familiar with apps like Shazam and Soundhound, which basically uh, are used when, whenever you want to detect some song uh, music that is currently played. Definitely Shazam, in order to uh, build and train their models, they are using some kind of um, audio data augmentation to increase their data sets of recorded songs. And finally, let's say we have environmental sound. An example could be um, industrial acoustics, for example. Uh, we have some machines in the industry that produce sound. And by applying some machine learning, we can find patterns in this sound and detect if some machine is malfunctioning or not. So in these cases, again, when we work with, with this type of audio files and audio data sets, we can apply audio data augmentation. Now I will take, talk about uh, different types, approaches, and practices. Generally speaking, there is parallel augmentation and sequential uh, augmentation. Parallel augmentation means that we have some set of transformers that run in parallel, and by passing one or, or a single audio file, we are getting um, multiple augmented data versions. And we also have this sequential approach where we have one input and we get one output at the end of this chain of transformers. And this is also known as augmentation chain. And here, uh, some good practice is to randomly select these transformers. So from n transformers, uh, in the first run, we can pick three transformers, in the next one, five, in the following, uh, one transformer, and so on. And also, we can play with uh, random picking of transformer parameters. For example, if we are trying to augment some voice database, speech database, we can play with voice speech, pitch frequency, and we can increase or decrease this frequency. We can define the range, for example, two tones up, two tones down. We can also define the step in this range. For example, it could be full tone or semitone that we can ra randomly pick and transform our audio data. Okay, so I already mentioned, and I will mention it once again, please use audio data augmentation only uh, on training data set, never use it on validation taste test data sets. And another important thing to keep in mind is that augmented data must be credible. And this means that we don't want to distort our audio files too much. So if we play too much with all kinds of different transformations, we can end up, for example, in case of voice, with some robotic voice. And we are building some um, automatic speech recognition system, so still we want uh, this signal to sound like a human's voice. Another classification of audio uh, data augmentation techniques is into offline augmentation and online augmentation. Again, something that sounds familiar. Offline augmentation is uh, actually pre-computed. It is done uh, before model training, and there are some pros and cons. Uh, good things is that uh, this way we are saving computation in the long run. And also, the code, uh, which purpose is, of course, audio data augmentation, is decoupled from, from the model's code. And there are some cons. Uh, it is slower, it is done on CPU, and it requires more storage, a storage where uh, we save all these augmented data files. On the right side, you have online augmentation, which happens at training time. And obviously, the good uh, side of, of, of this approach is that it is faster, it is done on CPU, um, many current uh, deep learning frameworks like PyTorch, they already support this kind of online augmentation. And uh, also, model deployment is much easier this way. There are also some uh, downsides. First, 
the code um, meant to be used for the augmentation is uh, tightly coupled uh, with model code, and it is computationally more expensive. Just imagine if you need to retrain your model once again, you will have to repeat the whole process of uh, augmentation, obviously, because you don't have all these files stored anywhere. So yeah, on the long run, it is computationally more expensive. Another way to classify audio data augmentation techniques is by the type of the input file. So in case of audio, we have two kinds of representations. We have raw audio, also known as a waveform, the thing that you can see on the left side. And on the right side, we have spectrogram. And those who are familiar with digital signal processing, they know that this is another representation of audio file. And here we have three dimensions. We have time and frequency uh, d d dimension. And we have this color scale, which actually represents the, the energy of the spectrogram or the audio file. Now, uh, based uh, on, on this classification into two groups, we have um, a set of augmentation techniques, one for waveforms, in case when we work with waveforms. We have time shifting, we have time stretching, pitch scaling, noise addition, impulse response addition, all kinds of different filtering, uh, then polarity inversion, random gain, and these are some of the most common transformations. Then. In case of spectrograms, we have time masking, frequency masking, time stretching, and pitch shifting. And now I will do uh, some demos, uh, talk about some use cases and best practices for each of these. So here we have um, an example of time shifting. And time shifting means that basically we are shifting our audio signal in time to the right or to the left. And if we play this original signal. Nula. Yeah, you'll see uh, how it sounds. Obviously, this is a female voice. Uh, it is pronunciation of uh, word zero uh, in Serbian. And then if we shift the signal to the right. Nula. And to the left. Nula. You won't hear the difference, actually, because we shifted this signal just by a couple of milliseconds. But this is enough for our model to make it more robust, because the model will treat these signals as a new data samples. The next type of transformation is time stretching. Here, we are. what are we trying to achieve? We can speed up or slow down a uh, signal. So let's uh, play the second one. Nula. And the next one. Nula. Yeah, this is the the one that is faster, and the next one. Nula. Yeah, the slower one. Again, uh, this is useful um, in music detection and sound detection apps. This kind of transformation is uh, commonly used. Then we have pitch scaling, which I already mentioned. So we can play with, with uh, pitch frequency. We can uh, pitch it up or down. So let's play all, all three sounds. Nula. Next one. Nula. Yep. You can see the, uh, hear that uh, now this voice sounds like a child's voice. And the last one, please. Nula. Yeah. It's definitely some deep male's voice. Maybe even distorted too much. So um, the next one is noise addition. So here, what can we do? We can add some noise to our uh, signal, please play the sound. Nula. And the next one. Nula. Yeah, definitely. You can hear the strong noise in the background. This type of noise is called white noise. There are a whole bunch of different kinds of noise. For example, white noise, pink noise. Then we have uh, brown noise, background environmental noise. We can also add cocktail party effect. We can add traffic noise. It depends on our needs and goals that we want to, to achieve. And definitely, uh, by doing this, we can make our models more robust to environmental noise. Then we have impulse response addition. So if we play the first original signal, Nula. you will hear that it is clean. And that's because it was recorded in a music studio with a professional microphone in a sound booth. And in reality, we have 
all kinds of reverberation in, in the background, some noise, environmental uh, impacts from the, our environment. And uh, what can we do? We can, for example, add reverb to our signal. So please play the next sound. Yeah, you can hear even the echo coming from some uh, big room. Of course, we can ar artificially add this effect to our original sound uh, by using convolution and impulse response. And this way we can also uh, make our model more robust to different kinds of environments, different rooms, size of rooms, different uh, microphones even. Places between and the space between speaker and the microphone as well. And then we have um, all kinds of different filtering. Here we have example of low pass and high pass filters. So please play all these three samples. Nula. Next one. Nula. Yeah, this one is when we keep low frequencies below 300 hertz. And the last one. Nula. Yeah. So here we keep only frequencies above, I don't know, 5 or 4 kilohertz. And uh, yeah, so this way we are mimicking um, different kinds of telecommunication channels. And it will be much clearer in this example where I present band pass filter. So when we combine low and high pass filters, we can actually create filters that pass only defined and specified frequency range. And this will be example of a phone signal where we keep frequencies uh, between 300 hertz and 3.4 or 4 kilohertz. So please play these two signals. Nula. And the next one. Nula. Yeah. Maybe the quality of the speakers are not the best one, but you will hear the sound that uh, really reminds to a telephone signal. So if we are creating some apps, uh, for this kind of purpose, it would be useful to apply this passband filtering. Then we have polarity inversion, definitely the easiest type of um, audio data transformation. Here, what are we doing? We are multiplying the amplitudes of our signal with minus one, which means that positive amplitudes will become the negative and vice versa. Uh, no need to play these uh, sounds because obviously you won't hear any difference, but this simple trick is enough for a model to treat this signal as a completely new sample. And then we also have an option to uh, add some random gain. So we can pick some random factor and multiply uh, the amplitudes of our original sound, and maybe it is uh, the size is not uh, appropriate and you won't hear the pointer. Never mind. Uh, in original signal, the max amplitudes are almost 0 0.2. And when we multiply it with some random factor, in this second case, we will see that, that these uh, max amplitudes are almost 0 0.75. And this way, we are uh, doing the trick and increasing the loudness of a sound. Now, let's talk about spectrogram augmentation techniques. This is, in this case, uh, this is an example where we do time masking. So we have the original spectrogram, and after applying time masking, we're getting something like this. So you can observe that uh, now we have this uh, vertical white stripes, or the places in time uh, that we cut from spectrogram. And we can, again, randomly uh, pick points in time and these time windows where we want to just remove the information. If you, and if you imagine spectrogram as a matrix, this means that some columns will be filled with zeros. Not necessarily. Uh, we can also fill these columns with some other value, with some average or median value, signal energy, or something like that. Then uh, another case similar approach is frequency masking. This time we are masking frequencies. So you can see that now we have these horizontal bars. And uh, again, this can be randomly picked and selected. And uh, you can see that uh, this bar in the middle, it doesn't start from the beginning of the signal. So we can also specify the time range. 
in which some frequency will be masked. And these two approaches are really good when we work with uh, spectrograms. They really improve the model's robustness. And when I say model, uh, in, in such cases, usually convolutional neural networks are being used. And finally, let's just mention some of the most popular Python libraries that we use for this purpose. Uh, we have Librosa, we have Audimentations, Torch Audimentations, Torch Audio, and Pyroom Acoustics. So let's start with the most popular one. It is Librosa. It is an open source Python library. This is widely used in audio signal processing. Uh, it supports some simple data augmentation techniques for audio, for example, time stretching, pitch shifting that I mentioned, um, and so on. And it supports only offline augmentation. The next one is audio augmentations. This is again an open source Python library. It supports loads of transformations and it supports also augmentation chains, uh, which is great online and offline transformations and it integrates with Keras and PyTorch. The only weakness is that uh, it supports only CPU. The next one is Torch Augmentations. So the name uh, is telling you that this is a fork project from uh, Augmentations. Um, it is obviously inspired to Augmentations. It uh, is made uh, for PyTorch and it supports online augmentation, GPU processing, and a decent number of transformations. Finally, we have a pure PyTorch framework and library for audio data augmentation. Uh, it is, again, an open source uh, library. It supports time frequency masking, time stretching, pitch shifting, uh, online augmentation. It is obviously perfectly integrated with PyTorch. It runs on GPU. And the last one is Pyroom Acoustics, which is not so popular. It is uh, a small Python library that is often used when we work with um, some audio array processing algorithms like beamfording, direction finding, adapting filtering, and so on. It also supports some uh, popular uh, and common functions for digital signal processing like calculation of short-term Fourier transformation, uh, convolution, and so on. And in case of our dem demos, we use this library to add reverb to our sound. Yeah. And of course, final words, uh, which library should we use? So if we have some minimal data augmentation needs, we should be fine if we go with Librosa. If we are already writing our code with PyTorch and uh, we need online augmentation, then we should go with uh, Torch Audio. Still, if we need more transformations, we should consider Torch Augmentations. And finally, if we really have some complex needs uh, in terms of some really uh, exotic transformations, uh, we should use augmentations, or maybe we can even, even uh, create our custom and write our custom functions for that. And that would be uh, everything from my side. Thank you for your attention, and please let and me know. I if you have, have any, any questions. questions. Yep. So, do we have any questions? Yep. Uh, just can we can we wait for the microphone? Here, here. Uh, just uh, uh, wait, just a second. Here's my Here's the mic. I I cannot hear you. Too pure. Uh, can you explain more about that? Uh, can you repeat? Uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, you had the uh, last uh, sentence uh, in your... <laughs> Sorry, can you bring the mic closer to your mouth? I can. Just a little bit closer. The microphone. Uh, okay. So, it's better. Uh, can you describe uh, a bit more about the last sentence? About what? About your last sentence. Last sentence? Yep. Com yeah, complex augmentation yeah. needs. That's it. That one, that means that uh, you have a need for some transformation that is not supported by in any of the listed Python libraries. That means complex audio data augmentations. Maybe a wrong uh, 
expression from my side, but yeah. We're out of time, but any other questions? Are you doing mainly voice augmentations? Uh, yeah, because, uh, I mean, uh, personally, because I have a PhD in automatic speech recognition, uh, the most used cases where I uh, applied audio data augmentation is in speech signals and voice signals. But of course, it could be applied on all kinds of audio signals, like I mentioned, on music, uh, on uh, some recordings of environmental sounds and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Georgie. So that was Georgie Grozdich from Grid Dynamics. Thank you.